AI is everywhere and every day. AI decides what I see online, ads, my Twitter feed. It even suggests friends on Facebook. AI is already sophisticated enough to connect people. AI looks out for me. It helps with the diagnosis of my medical scans. It detects fraudulent credit card transactions. I like leather goods as much as the next person, but I've never bought any leather goods in the Ukraine. AI talks and listens, a real game changer. I've used all of Cortana, Alexa, Siri, and Assistant during the preparation of this talk. Of course, the speech recognition is good, but not perfect. When I request the Kaiser Chiefs, I usually get the Kaiser Chiefs, but I still sometimes get the weather forecast in Kazakhstan. Is this my bit now? Uh, not yet. In our modern world, AI finds its purpose to increase shareholder value. Much of AI is owned by rich corporations, and it facilitates their business and allows them to become richer. Of course, one of the ways to do that is to sell us things, irrespective of whether or not we need them. AI can do a lot more than that. Of course, it could be much worse. Hollywood loves to entertain us with tales of AI in the brains of robots, the Terminator, Ex Machina, that are going to kill us all. And also, in terms of super-intelligent, disembodied AI computers, HAL and Skynet, with strange motivations and with no empathy for humans. In the 2001 film, the HAL AI computer looks after the crew, it manages the spaceship where they live, it talks to them, it plays chess with them. When HAL goes crazy, in, in the ensuing struggle, um, the, the crew, most of the crew and HAL all perish. I can't help but feel it would all gone better if they just kept talking. Yes, HAL should have opened those pod bay doors. So many commentators consider intelligence as lying along a line, as we see here. A slime mold has intelligence. Its intelligence is evolutionary. So every generation of slime molds is just a little better adapted to the environment than the previous generation. A dog has a profound level of intelligence, unparalleled by any AI to date. In particular, a dog has a theory of mind. It understands that it's not the only mind in the universe and that humans and other dogs also have minds. So a dog will wait expectantly for the reaction of its master to a newly mastered trick. Human intelligence is really complicated. Albert Einstein was a brilliant physicist, and yet everybody in this audience is much better than Albert Einstein at a wide variety of tasks requiring intelligence. For example, I believe that Einstein had a terrible sense of direction. Commentators such as Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk have suggested that so long as AI has narrowly defined goals, we're all safe. But if we give AI the ability to write computer programs, then something remarkable might happen. This event whereby an AI rewrites itself, becoming more and more intelligent until it reaches a level of superintelligence, uh, incomprehensible to humans. The superintelligence scenario is plausible and we should mitigate against its effects. At a cinema last year, some of the world's leading AI scientists got together to draw up 23 principles for research and development in AI, stressing the need for not undirected research in AI, but rather AI for specific and beneficial effects. They also stressed the need for parallel investment not just in AI, which is deeper and stronger, but in AI, which is more beneficial. If we have a superintelligent AI, 
we're going to have to work with it. It would simply be unethical to enslave a super intelligent being, even if we could. All of the success to date in machine learning has been narrow. So a computer, an AI computer, might be able to suggest the best move in a game of chess, but it certainly couldn't savor the joy of victory in chess, nor even move the pieces on the board, possibly. Intelligence has many dimensions. I'm an AI researcher, and I'd like to think I'm a pretty decent computer programmer. I'm learning to play the guitar, I don't speak Mandarin Chinese, and I can't paint. Everybody in this audience brings a different range of talents and skills from their intelligence. Like love, intelligence is a many splendored thing. So I don't believe intelligence fits very neatly on a line at all. We might get AI which is better and better at playing chess or judging credit card transactions, but we don't really have a way to attack the problem of creating an AI with the intelligence of a dog, let alone the intelligence of a human. But there's a new game in town. Machine learning is really starting to work. Here we don't program AI directly, but the AI learns from data. We have to use the right data, label it correctly, and establish the right sort of goals for the AI. If we use the wrong data, we get a biased an erroneous conclusion. So if I'm investigating internet surfing habits and I have a data set consisting mostly of white males, I might conclude that the most important things on the internet are sports betting and Scarlett Johansson. If I label the data wrong, then again I get errors and biased conclusions. The Watson AI is capable of, of prescribing possible treatments given symptoms having analyzed the data for thousands of medical case histories. But at some stage, it's been remarked that those case histories were for the treatments given, which were the best treatments that each patient could afford and not necessarily the best available. And hence, there is a bias towards cheaper treatments. If the goals of the AI are wrong, well, we've got no chance. But the most obvious case there is AIs that choose things that we may wish to buy without any consideration of whether that might make us happy. Training a machine learning is more like training a child than writing a program. If we wanted to teach a child the benefits of good nutrition, we would define labels, good and bad, associated with various foods, and goals in the sense that we would specify the benefits of eating good foods and the problems associated with eating bad foods. The machine learning AI does a translation from a data input to a data output or decision. So for example, the data input in a self-driving car could be the video feed coming in to the camera and the data output could be the steering wheel angle that the AI chooses given that input. The encoding in this case is as a network, which has been called a neural network. And every element of that network encodes a tiny fraction of the knowledge to translate from the inputs to the outputs. Now, it's called a neural network, but it's not really very similar to the human brain, except in one very important respect. The way in which it arrived at a particular decision output from the input is very hard to understand. We have no clear way of understanding that route. But machine learning is changing the world. Yeah, so we have speech and image recognition. Uh, we have better engineering design. We have much better understanding of humans from data. And we've got some fabulous computer games. The problems that are solved in each of these cases um, are not easily specified using a precise recipe, but rather are encoded using millions of examples of the sorts of behavior that we require from the AI. It's exciting to speculate as to whether the same sorts of approaches might lead to the sort of general intelligence that we associate with humans, or even lead to machine consciousness and self-awareness. We have a good intuition as to what is meant by 
consciousness. We can see our thoughts, but something is doing the seeing, and that's our consciousness. It's going to be very hard to detect consciousness in an AI. And one of the pioneers of computing, Alan Turing, thought that that wasn't such an interesting question, really. He devised a test, which is subsequently known as the Turing test, essentially saying that if an AI could fool most of the people most of the time into believing it was acting like a human, then we might as well regard it as intelligent. We can only observe behavior, so why should the bar for intelligence of an AI be higher than the bar for measuring intelligence in a human? Some scientists have speculated that as computers get more complicated and more networked, we may eventually get to a situation where the internet simply wakes up. I don't know how plausible that really is. But, and, and, and if it had happened, whether we could actually detect it. Who knows? Right now, the laptop in front of me might be speaking at a conference on the internet to a bunch of other laptops, speculating on the question as to whether humans will ever become intelligent. I'd like you to introduce you to my co-presenter, Delilah. Hi, Peter. Can I do my bit now? Uh, not yet. I want to say a little bit about what you are first. I could do that. I've been listening to you for ages. Your Fitbit shows your pulse is a little high. You could use a break. OK. Over to you, then. Wouldn't it be great if AI were delightful? We have tech for knowing what people want. To buy, at least. Yes, and using the same sort of AI technology, we could work out what they need for eudaimonia. Shall I explain what you mean by eudaimonia? No, it's OK. I'm in flow now. Eudaimonia is a term coined by the ancient Greeks for an especially deep and resilient form of happiness, where you feel connected with others and happy with your goals and your life. So you're a delightful AI. I do my best. And so maybe a delightful AI could be something as simple as an app that works out what sort of things might be good for us, but using a different set of labels and gives us a nudge. Absolutely. And what if we don't know what we want? Tricky. Organizations like the United Nations and the World Health Organization have been thinking about what the world needs for ages now. OK. Maybe it would be motivating to know how your actions contribute to a better world. Instead of feeling tiny, because all you can do is recycle a few bottles, go to the gym or teach your child to read. You could understand the global effects of millions of people doing good things like that. And I could feel part of all that. Yes. And what if I've got the blues? You're not going to sing now, <laughs> are you? Uh, no, no. Um, but sometimes I don't want to save the world. Simply, sometimes I just want to save myself. There's a growing body of work on positive psychology with researchers, authors, and thinkers starting to get to grips with what helps us flourish. Andy Cope's research has studied two percenters, brilliant individuals who achieve eudaimonia by bringing a particular positivity and resilience to their lives, and improve the lives of others around them. His books and ideas explore how to increase your happiness through choosing positive thoughts and actions, and not allowing negative ones to linger. So helping people become two percenters seems really hard to me. And maybe that's a job for superintelligence. Is there anything we can do before we have superintelligence? I could suggest ideas that might help you get closer to being a two percenter by comparing the data on what you are doing to the data on what other two percenters are doing. Over time, learning not only what it takes to be a two percenter, but even more importantly, how a person like you can become a two percenter and achieve eudaimonia, becoming happy and resilient and having good connections and goals. OK, but I ask again, what if I'm down? Meditation works well, too, for depression, anxiety and stress. And there are now several apps for that. One of them won Apple's app of the year in 2017. 
I could suggest meditations, relaxations, exercise and such like, knowing how effective it has been with other people like you, using data and machine learning. That all sounds very worthy, but sometimes, along with the salad, I want a little ice cream. If you need some music, a good box set, or a game that's okay, maybe you could call on a friend. I could suggest that too. The technology needed to make an AI Delilah pretty much exists already. We can assess mood from audio and video data and heart rate and physiological data, as well as online uh, surfing habits. We can label that data rather than with what you want to buy, rather looking at what you need in order to achieve this state of eudaimonia and be happy. And of course, we can obtain a lot of data. Yes, so data about your contacts in your diary, even data about the contents of your kitchen cupboard in principle. But allowing somebody all that data is going to require a new era of trust. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, one of the founders of the internet, is working hard to empower people to control their own data. He aims to create a new type of internet where you can understand where your data is stored and who is accessing it. Okay, so my data can make me happy, and maybe it contributes in a small way to making lots of other people happy. Yes, in principle. It's tricky because we live in a suspicious and litigious world. Maybe AI for eudaimonia can help to change that? The problems are societal and political, but AI tech is nearly ready to help. Okay, and what do you think a world full of AI Delilahs might be like? The ideal seems to be empowered people growing towards what they want, with a simpler yet more productive and enjoyable life. Using and of course ignoring the AI's invitations to try out new activities and meet new people. Understanding their role in the wider world, and how their activities make a difference. And particularly putting the most valuable thing they have, their attention, into activities that are more likely to make themselves and others happier. Sounds to me like a world full of AI Delilahs might actually be quite delightful. AI Delilahs could be a catalyst, but the last thing any of us need is a population of zombified humans staring into their phones, feeling disempowered and disinterested as the AI tells them what to do next. It'll take a lot of skill to achieve the right balance. Expert understanding as to what makes humans tick underpinned by a large set of well-labeled data. Why am I interested? I lead two large research labs at the University of York, bringing together games, media, AI, virtual reality, and other technologies, and trying to understand how we can empower people to be more creative, how we can help them understand about their data, and how we can generate, by merging good decisions and interesting stories, the next generation of types of content in games and media. Delilah, I think you should come clean. Okay. I'm just a script. Not really an AI, at all. More sort of a computerized ventriloquist's dummy. Sorry about that. But the tech we need to build delightful AI is almost there already. It doesn't need conscious, super intelligent AI. It just needs smart humans, trust, goodwill, machine learning, and agreement on how to label the data. AI might kill us, but what if AI were delightful? Thank you. <laughs>